call his sausage. Hear about this? When the clerk looked at him and asked him, Are you Polish? Well, the guy was clearly offended and said, Well, yes, I am, but what's that do with anything? I mean, if I'd come in and asked for a uh, German bratwurst, would you thought I was German? Or if I came in and asked for Italian sausage, would you think I was Italian? Or if I came in and asked for a kosher hot dog, would you just assume I'm Jewish? If I came in and asked for a taco, would you just assume I'm Mexican? I mean, would you? Would you? The clerk said no. It was well and all right. Exactly my point. Why in the world did you ask me if I was Polish just because I ordered some Polish sausage? Then the clerk said, because you're a Toys R Us, sir. <laughs> Possibly when you look at the sermon title today, uncensored, you identified with the guy who was asking for Polish sausage at the Toys R Us, and you were wondering, am I in the right place? Because typically in church we censor things, don't we? We don't talk about these subjects that, 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 that need to be censored. I mean, we, we, we censor everything. I mean, to say, today we're going to talk about something uncensored. We say, oh my. And I got a new story. Here's what we're going to talk about. Don't get down. We're going to talk about sex and lust and adultery. There's a funeral dinner here on the Tuesday, and I read my sermon title by some of the ladies who were cooking, and they all really liked the title. And I had it, Sex, Lust, and Adultery. I thought, I better, I better calm that down a little bit, because they were real excited about hearing that sermon. So I changed it to Uncensored. I won't point any fingers or anything like that. Thank you, ladies, for cooking that uh, wonderful bereavement dinner this week. <coughs> But, I mean, if there's a subject we typically don't talk about at church, it would be sex, lust, and adultery. I and mean, we hesitate to talk about it. We, we avoid talking about it. Yet I think it's in the time for the church to begin to talk about this because the world, the secular world, has plenty to say about sex, lust, and adultery, don't they? I mean, we hear all these phrases that, that, like this one, Oh, you can't help me to love. You may heard that one? If it makes you happy, it must be what's best for you. Some would even say, if it makes you happy, it's what God wants for you. You can't control your feelings, but what you need to know is that these phrases are actually alive from the pit of hell. God's Word doesn't teach us or command us to chase after what we think will make us happy. God's Word teaches us and commands us to chase after Holiness. That's what God's Word teaches us. Say, so, now the first service got excited to say amen there. I'm not comparing to God. <laughs> they really like that holiness part. <coughs> Open your Bibles. Too, too late, I'm sorry. <laughs> Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. We're going to pick up where we left off last week in the Sermon on the Mount. This red letter experience. Because it's here that Jesus gives us the uncensored truth about sex, lust, and adultery. And this is what he says, Matthew chapter 5, verse 27. You've heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus was talking to people who were very familiar with the law. They, they knew the law. We talked about that last week. These folks were very, very familiar with the law. They had it memorized. They, they knew it by heart. So they were familiar with Exodus chapter 20, verse 14, the seventh commandment that says, do not commit adultery. They knew that. They, they had heard that one. Also, the people Jesus was speaking to realized how serious of an offense adultery was. See, it's so serious that the Old Testament law, the Mosaic law, actually commanded death for those who were caught in adultery. We're told in Leviticus, if a man commits adultery with another man's wife, both the adulterer and the adulteress will be put to death. I, I point this out to you because sin is serious. It's very serious. And adultery was, and still is, a serious offense, because it's a sin. Hollywood can try to glamorize it. The media can try to minimize it. Publishers can even try to justify it. But they cannot change. 
assumes the truth that adultery is sin and sin is serious. By Jesus teaching us the full meaning of the law, we learn that to look at another with lust is actually adultery. <coughs> to even think about it. See, the whole law in regards to adultery is that emotional adultery is still adultery. Fantasy adultery is still adultery. The whole I can look as long as I don't touch rule is actually false and contrary to how a follower of Jesus lives their lives. In other words, if we've already thought about them in a lustful way, thought of what it would be like to be with them, flirted with her at the gym, mentally undressed them, Look where we should not be looking. Watch that scene on late night Skinamax, I mean Cinemax, that we know we shouldn't be watching. Sought out that heated romance novel that we know is not healthy for us to read. Entertain those tingles that we felt when you talked to them at work. If we've done these things, then Jesus is saying, you're guilty of adultery. We've sinned against God. Now in verse 29, Jesus says that sin is so serious that if your eye, even your good eye, and I only have one good eye, so this really hits me. So I, I can imagine what it would be like to walk around. I have like 2,800 in this left eye. So if I lost my right eye, and Jesus says that my sin in my life is so serious that even if my good eye, my right eye, causes me to sin, causes us to lust, gouge it out and throw it away, for it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. The word Jesus used for hell here is actually Gehinnom. And Gehinnom was a deep burning ravine outside of Jerusalem that was used as a dump. It was always on fire, always burning. It's where all the defiled things went. It was a defiled place, especially to the Jews who took their cleanliness so serious. It was the most detestable place that the Jews could even imagine. And Jesus is saying those who live a life of sin, those who live in sin, even those who just sin on the inside, even on the inside, They'll be condemned to the eternal fire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. I hope this shakes us up. It should. I hope it alarms us. Because hell is scary. Hell is scary. Each year on Halloween, uh, we as a church, we, we load up a group of us and we go seek out a, a hell adventure of some sort. Hang with me here. There's a place over in Ellettsville. Not no, and, and there's a it's called Hell House. Any of you been there? And it's this experience where you walk through what possibly hell might be like. And it's scary. It makes the little hairs on your arms stand up. There's one down in Bedford called a journey through hell. That's what we're going through this year. And you actually walk through this hell experience, and it's a little longer. It's a little walk, and you're out in this field, and there's fire everywhere. And then people come out, actors, and they tell you their story of how they ended up in hell. Oh, it's pretty alarming. It, it shakes you up. It um, definitely makes you think. I remember one time I, I took a, a group to this hell experience in, in Bedford. And we had the van, and I was driving the van, and this one boy, Bobby, he, he said, I'm not getting in the van. I said, why aren't you getting in the van, Bobby? I said, get in the van. I got to take it home. He said, I'm not getting in the van. It's a pretty good size kid. I was going to have some trouble getting in the van. But I thought I could probably do it. Bobby, you can get in the van. I'm not getting in the van, Steve, because you might have a wreck and kill me. And I'm going to go to hell if you do. I said, well, Bobby, what do you think you need to do about that? I don't know what I need to do. 
to a bow. Bobby accepted Christ as a Savior. He turned away from the sin. We actually, he would not even get in the van until we had to talk to him. We had to go knock on the trap like, hey, we need to open up your baptistry. Oh, we're not doing it. Well, I know that's not the plan, but that's what's going on tonight. So. <laughs> Bobby won't get in the van until he's baptized. I think Bobby had a right view of hell. And I think that's pretty you know, correct view of hell, don't you? He wasn't going to take any chances in his life. And he wanted to trust Jesus and he wanted to do, he wanted to be obedient to Jesus in every way. Now we have an appointment for this journey through hell on October 24th. We'll leave here at 645. Let me know if you want to go. Now I want to take you there. I want you to experience this. I want it to bring forth a, a holy fear within us. Yeah, it's a little bit it's scary, it's a little bit uncomfortable, but you know what? It's nothing compared to the turmoil that's in the real hell. Nothing. Church, I believe the reality of hell should actually shake us a holy fear in us that causes us to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. For just as the Bible says that no eye has seen and no ear has heard and no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him, we can't imagine the misery of hell. Jesus referred to it as the eternal fire, where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth and says, it is eternal punishment. Eternal punishment. Hell's not just one big, ah! It's all gone. Hell's just one big, ah! Heaven's just one big, wee! That's not the meaning of eternal. It's everlasting. It doesn't stop. It continues. And it's right that we are shaken into a holy fear that causes us to seek our Lord. Which is exactly why Jesus says, if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, just go ahead and cut it off and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Now let me clarify something. Jesus is not teaching self-mutilation. But he is giving us an extreme example so we will wake up and realize how serious our sin actually is. Sin is serious. Hell is scary. Marriage is sacred. Many of the people in Jesus' day actually used the law to justify the oppressing of women by just divorcing them whenever they saw fit. See, in Jesus' day and in time, it wasn't so easy for a woman if her husband left her in abortion. She couldn't just run out and get a job or go get her own place. It was a lot more difficult. And in Deuteronomy, we read about this certificate of divorce. And we read about it like it's a regular thing. I'll read some of it to you. If a man marries a woman becomes, and she becomes displeasing to him because he finds something indecent about her and writes her a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her on her way. And after she leaves his house, she becomes the wife of another man and her second husband dislikes her and writes a certificate of divorce, gives it to her and sends her from his house. Get this, they just send her out, buy another certificate, go get another one. Oh, I don't like her, I'll write her a certificate. Are you catching this? If the husband dislikes the wife, he just writes her a certificate of divorce. Sends her on her way. Now, the, the Jews had two different views about this. See, some believe that something indecent was referring to marital unfaithfulness. Others believe that something indecent was anything that was displeasing to the husband. <coughs> oh, you, you burned your husband's food? Not a good cook, here's your certificate of divorce. Don't do the laundry right? Here's your certificate of divorce. But we read in Matthew chapter 19, verse 3, some of the Pharisees came and they tried to trap Jesus with this question. And they said, well, should a man be allowed to divorce his wife for just any reason? And Jesus replied, listen, God made them male and female. This explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, 
and the two are united into one since they're no longer two but one let no one split apart for God is joined together who joined it together? God did right? now the Pharisees didn't like this answer so they asked Jesus then why did Moses say the law that a man could give his, his wife a written notice of divorce and just send her away and Jesus replied Moses permitted divorce only as a concession to your hard hearts. Jesus said this because marriage is sacred. It's very sacred. I know we live in a society that doesn't take marriage so seriously. It doesn't see it as sacred. I praise God for couples like Walt and Kate Cryer who celebrate their 51st birthday. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Well, you couples have set the example for us. You married 60 years, 30 years, 40 years. It's sacred. You're not crazy for putting up with it. It's sacred. I say that. Maybe. And that's vice versa, folks. You know, it's so sacred that Jesus teaches us. <laughs> yeah, it's vice versa. It is so sacred that uh, Jesus teaches, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife will give her a certificate of divorce, but I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife except for miracle and thankfulness causes her to become an adulteress, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Now, I want to point something out here. Jesus did not say that if there was unfaithfulness that you have to get divorced. So you couples, well, even though there's been this unfaithfulness in your marriage, you said, you know what? I believe that the blood of Jesus Christ is sufficient. And I forgive you and let's work this out and let's let God restore what is broken. You're not crazy either. Because marriage is sacred and it's worth the effort, folks. It's worth the effort. And Jesus wants us to understand this. He's the one that's to understand it's not something you just jump in and jump out of. It's not to be defiled. It's not to be disrespected. Marriage is to be set apart as a holy covenant that's to be honored. The book of Hebrews declares marriage should be honored by all. And the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. Brothers and sisters, sex outside of marriage is a sin against God. And sometimes we think we'd be happier if we could just have a few exceptions to the rules. Maybe we say, well, you don't know what it's like to be a, a teenager in today's world or be a college student in today's world. You don't know what it's like to be divorced after you've been married for 20 years. And we think, may think that, that we need some exceptions to God's law. We may think that it would be more fun and more exciting if there was just some exceptions to God's law. But stepping outside of God's boundaries for us only, listen up, it only brings forth harmful and hurtful circumstances and consequences. I mean, just imagine a man learning how to skydive. And he's there with his instructor and the pilot, and they're getting up the altitude to skydive. And he starts getting there. He gets real excited about thinking about sailing through the air. And he starts taking off his parachute. And the instructor and the pilot say, man, what are you doing? Here, he jump out of the airplane. He said, well, I'm taking this dude off because I want to experience the, the freedom and the joy of soaring through the air with no strings attached. Man, it'd be a fool, right? It'd be a fool. Yeah, he, yes, he's free to do as he wishes. And God allows us to be free to do as we wish. What we think might make us happy. But if he jumps out of the airplane without any strings attached, he's not free to escape the consequences of his actions, and neither are we. The consequences of our sin is much bigger, much, much bigger, and much, much worse than we realize it damages us emotionally, it damages us spiritually, it damages us physically. It damages our family. It damages our friends, our community. It damages our church. And God doesn't want to see us hurt ourselves or hurt anyone else. 
So he doesn't budge on his law. He is holy, and our sin cannot be in his presence. Therefore, we must take our sin serious. We must. Now, we like to classify sin in all different kinds of categories. But I want to let you know that God doesn't give us a letter grade on our performance in regards to our sin. And say, oh, well, you two were just flirting, so I'll give you a C. Or, yeah, you two had, had sex out of wedlock, but you ended up marrying each other, so I'll give you a D. Or you were an adulterer, or you slept around, so I'm giving you an F. That's not how he does it. No. God only gives a pass and a fail. And Jesus said, if even if you've looked at someone else with a lust in your heart, you've already committed adultery. Pass or fail. It's not a letter grade. So I hope that would alarm us that first of all in this lesson, none of us have any business judging anyone else except for the person we're looking at in the mirror. Now if you walk down this hallway outside this door, if you've never seen this hallway outside this door, you, you need to. It's actually, we have the prettiest hallway in, in, in the state, I believe, maybe even in the whole country. It, it's a gorgeous hallway. It's beautiful. Because in that hallway, there's these pieces of cardboard that are on the wall. And those pieces of cardboard, they tell our stories. They, they say different things on one side. They, some may say, like, struggling with alcohol on one side, but that's not the side you see anymore, because on the other side, there's another story. Maybe it says, now I'm free and in love with Jesus. They say different things. There, there's these different sides all through there. Maybe on one side it says, maybe somebody who's made a lot of mistakes, they say, you know, I'm haunted by my past. I'm shattered by my anger. There's all these different signs. But like I said, this is the side you don't see. We don't want you to see that because, well, first of all, that's not who we are anymore. We've been changed. God's delivered us. That's not who we are anymore. Who knows? Maybe there's one out there that even God says that. That's what most of the signs say. <clears throat> not all of us. But we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're free to justify the grace of Christ Jesus. When we start looking at the law and regards like Jesus taught in schoolness, especially this issue with lust, isn't that what the sign can say? Like I said, that's only one side of the sign. I know some of these are kind of shocking and alarming. But what we have found is a church, my mind up there says, on one side, something that I'm not going to tell you. Know your business. That's what I mean. No. It's like the back of your signs, none of my business, right? But what I found is I took this failure I had to God, and He actually, my, my failure wasn't final when I took it to Him. And that wasn't the end of the story. For He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Yeah. It's the new. There's this newness that comes. Newness. A new story. A new testimony. I ask you something kind of personal to think about, not to tell me, not to tell your neighbor, but you just think about what's your cardboard testimony? What, what would your piece of cardboard say? If you just condensed the failure of your lives into just one, one word, what would it say? The thing that you're so embarrassed about, the thing that you're so shameful about. 
Say, adulterer, hater, greedy, liar, thief, addict, prideful, gossip, selfish. But here's the more important question I have for you. What does the other side of your side of your sign say? Or is it blank and it say nothing at all? Isn't that the real issue? Not, not what does this side say? What does this side say? Or is it still blank? Because you're still living in this side. You're still dealing with this side. You're still trying to take care of this failure you have on your own. What's amazing is I, I tried to fix myself for so many years. Oh, I fixed myself. I'm standing up on my own two feet. I'm, I'm a man. What I found is my failures are not something I can fix. That's not something I, I can even fix. What I found is that I had to bring my failure, just take it to the cross of Jesus Christ, and I had to just throw it down. And then through the power of His Holy Spirit, I, I exactly figured out how God does all this. Not for me to know, just for me to experience, okay? But through the power of His Holy Spirit, which the Bible says is the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the grave. God's Spirit comes alive in us when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and are buried with Him in baptism and raised to new life. We are raised by the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the grave to walk in new life. He can write this story this time. So he can show me what his purpose is. And if the other side of your sign is still blank, you need to bring your failure, you need to bring your sin to Jesus Christ and be transformed by his love and his power. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church these words. And I like to think that when you read it's just the same. He wrote it to Smithville Christian Church, he, he said, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or who commit adultery or who are male prostitutes or prostitutes homosexuality or thieves or greedy people or drunkards or abusive or cheap people None of these, and the list could just go on and on and on and on. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. And some of you were once like that. He's saying, yeah, that's who you, key word being, not our word. But you were cleansed. You were made holy. Holy means set apart made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. God does the work. Do you know you failed? Do you believe that Jesus died for your failures on the cross for your sins? If so, this next part of the service is the time we call invitation because you're invited to take those sins and those failures and lay them at the foot of Jesus' cross in faith. To say, God, I can't deal with this. You need to. Maybe you're already a believer, but you're dealing with this issue. And you just need to come in faith and you just need to sit in the Holy front seats and you say, God, I can't carry this. I need you to carry this. When you do that, you write the story. Don't worry about that. You write the story if you'll truly give it to Him. We'll go ahead and stand. I find also something very, very amazing. Is that is when we bring our failures to Christ, not only is our failure not final, but He gives us complete. The Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, so your transgressions are removed from us. Maybe we sit there and we carry it, we can't forgive ourselves. Well, 
In Jesus Christ, you can from faith and believe this, His blood actually paid the price for your failure and my failure. Oh, it's great news. I hope you'll respond to this news. Allow the transformation to begin in you. You'll experience new life. If, you will, if you've never done it before, surrender your life to Him completely. Be buried into the waters of baptism. Be raised anew. Come celebrate being part of the family of God, His, his church. Pray to this letter. And begin to do the work in your life today. If you want to respond to the invitation, this seat right here is open for you to come during this next song.